Hi, let's talk about governance. The United States has the most complex governance system in the world. It's got three different layers of government, legislative, judicial, and executive. And you know, the way it works is that all these different branches keep tabs on each other. And so if the president does something illegal or goes too far, the legislative branch can come in and impeach. If the legislators are not passing laws in a way that makes sense, the executive can then pass executive orders to get things done. If there is a conflict between the two branches we just mentioned, the, a judge who was supposed to be independent will be able to step in and figure out who's right. So on top of those different checks and balances, within the, within the United States, there are also three different layers of government where all this is happening all the time. These, this sort of constant moving blob that's also multi-layered because we also have national, state, and federal governments. And even on a local level, we've got the county and the city. And, you know, the, all these things, in theory, provide the opportunity for greater diversity and for better opportunities to try different things, to see what works better. And you can see how, on one level, you know, this sort of mechanism works very well if people cooperate. And in fact, you know, that triple layer of government that I just mentioned, local, state, and federal, for the most part, doesn't really come into play because the, the federal government is not really going to care about what goes on in a small town in Mississippi, unless the media gets involved. And that's what's happened with the civil rights movement quite a few decades ago. And so you can also see that in addition to the complexity that we just mentioned, there's a fourth branch or quasi branch of government that makes it all work. And that would be a journalism or media branch that's also honest. And so you put all these things together and for the most part, you have the opportunity for smaller players to be left alone, to grow at their own pace, and yet be connected to a larger body of work. And you can see how this sort of mechanism works best when people cooperate. And so if they're actively involved in democratic procedures, such as town halls, if they're actively sitting down with their politicians and they're electing people who are wise, or at least wiser than they are, they can create a system of incremental improvement over time where the needs of the population from the smallest individual in the smallest town are considered. Now you can also see how the system has major risks because on the one level, on the one hand, it also requires that more people and more branches be honest and sincere. You can see how to the extent that you have, say a dishonest executive who decides, for example, to bomb Cambodia in secret, the bombing will happen and then the impeachment. In other words, the executive has quite a bit of leeway. You can also see how if the lawyers are out of touch, they can pass laws, but if those laws are not enforced or if they are too broad, you can see how the opportunity for abuse multiplies. And so when I talk about this accordion-like blob that is multi-layered, the idea really is that 
you have a constantly shifting system that is supposed to get better over time. In other words, the laws change over time. There are more laws over time. There are demographic changes over time. And the idea, the real idea in the system is to be able to create a flexible system that allows people to adapt as things change. In order for that to happen, of course, what we just talked about, namely honesty and sincerity have to be present. And of course, competence. And so you can also see how to the extent that you have this kind of a system that is better suited to adapt to changing needs. It can also be better suited to diversity of all kinds of thought, of methods, so on and so forth. But you can also see how the risks multiply because every single entity and actor within this structure has to have an incentive to cooperate. And if that doesn't happen, you have conflict that doesn't really go anywhere. At least not in a way that causes incremental improvement over time. And so in almost every similar system, you will always have the best of all possible worlds and the worst of all possible worlds, or perhaps the best of times and the worst of times. There's been in, in the 21st century, a competing system to what I just mentioned. And the competing system offers efficiency. It says, sure, we can have a system where if we, the exec executive branch, make a mistake, somebody can sue us, take us to court, and expose the problem and fix it. But why not, given technology today, why not simply create a system where the executive branch is its own check and balance using surveillance and technology. In other words, rather than wait for a problem to come up, technology allows central governments to fix problems right away without the need to have interference from, in some cases, self-interested parties or parties that might even have interests that are inimical to the goals of the existing majority or the existing government. And you can see how this would be preferable to the extent that the legal systems that I just mentioned before are inefficient, costly, and just don't work. In other words, they result in, say, a financial system coming in and basically issuing insurance policies and financial settlements rather than structural change. And in that kind of a system, you can see how an executive branch that is honest and effective would be more productive and over time would create exactly the incremental, in incremental change and therefore incremental progress that I just mentioned. The other advantage to the second system is that since you're not shifting priorities every four to five years or two to four years, you have a better ability to negotiate with other countries. And you also have the opportunity to invest in a way that creates stability for both people and investors. And that is because stability and predictability go together. And so you can also see how an executive first branch can be far more effective compared to a system that has multiple checks and balances, but also has dishonest lawyers. Well, maybe not even dishonest, dishonest lawyers, just lawyers that come out of law school with $100,000 in debt and are not really able to take on cases that protect the individual from better financed interests or just interests that are inimical to the individual. In other words, a system where the status quo 
has so many advantages that it really isn't interested in change. So the executive-led system is essentially a, technolo a technological system. It's not just surveillance that has to work. Everything has to work. Financial systems have to work. People have to be able, be able to build things. People have to be able to live in a society where things work. And if you live in a society where things work, because you are living under an executive branch or a one-party state that is steadily improving people's lives over time, you can see how that system would be preferable in some cases to the first system. The complaint about the second system has always been that it's stolen, that it values efficiency over everything else. And in some ways that's true. If the executive branch, which also controls the military, creates a trickle-down economy where somebody in a small town receives the benefits of research that is taking place on a higher level, you can see that how that kind of a system would be somewhat beneficial, but also in the absence of private competition would create a homogenous solution. In other words, today, under the first system, the idea is that the individual has a lot of choices. If they don't like the choices in their town or their city or their state, they can go somewhere else and live under a different system. And also, even if they dislike the government, they can also use a private system because there was ample private competition in the first system, in theory. And so you can see how, again, the first system creates fertile grounds for experimentation, diversity, and creativity. But you can also see that a lot of it is based in theory because to the extent that you're 25 years old, you come out of school with $25,000 or more in debt, you really can't leave where you are because you have to go to a place where some people know what school you graduated from and they're able to leverage an alumni network to be able to focus on paying off that debt, those student loans. You can also see how over time, as somebody builds enough connections, where families build enough connections, you can also see how the system or any system makes it easier to stay close to home unless another place offers substantial economic opportunities or higher wages and so on and so forth. And so when we're discussing governance in the 21st century, what we're talking about is a system or a battle between the competent executive and the fragile democracy. And that's really one of the reasons why countries like the United States are floundering because they've allowed a system to take root that doesn't actually provide the benefits that it's supposed to provide. People are moving, but for the most part, they still have to have the financial means to do so. They still have to have the connections to do so. And the real reason that the first system works is because of the private sector. In about 20 years ago, if you moved from a big city to a small city in the United States, you would lose access to a lot of the cultural benefits that you're used to. But today, every city has access to gourmet coffee beans, theaters, and so on and so forth, simply by paying for an Amazon Prime subscription. And so the costs in some areas 
have become more accessible. In other words, there are choices and ample choices under the first, under the first system because of, again, technology that focuses on the consumer. And so at the same time, as we're, eval as we're evaluating all these different things, if access to consumer choices and efficiency, making sure that you can get those choices quickly, if that kind of access becomes prioritized over a kind of system or a kind of society, I should say, where people are encouraged to cooperate in order to create incremental progress as a society, you can see how the first system and the second system aren't really all that different in the end. They both rely on technology just in different ways. The first system simply relies more on the private sector than the government when it comes to te technological progress. And that's really the dilemma if you're a political philosopher today in the West. The real dilemma is how to counter in some logical way the idea of a strong, competent executive succeeding over a society that has become increasingly distracted and increasingly frustrated with the kind of options that they have. And you can see how the first system is quite, was more colorful. It creates a lot of stories. Under the executive branch, you're probably not going to get as many stories. The idea is to create efficiency, things don't work, create a solution, and simply get it done. And so these complaints about a soulless society have been made before against the second system. But it's not at all clear why the second system wouldn't be able to foster creativity in theory. Remember that the second system relies heavily on military spending and just technological progress that in many cases is driven by central government spending. And that's because it's not outsourcing it to the private sector. And as a result, you're in a system where you also have a trickle down economy, but one that prioritizes following orders. In other words, the conflict between the second system and creativity is that a centralized government that prioritizes the executive and therefore the police and the military is prioritize, prioritizing a culture of following orders. And that kind of a culture typically doesn't result in artists or even dissent in a way that creates the kind of coming together that I mentioned before. And in fact, you'll notice I'm putting in terms that are interchangeable, trickle down economy, military spending, and so on and so forth, to show you that one of the reasons we're having issues all over the world politically is because these systems have become similar to each other. And if there's no difference really between these systems, then efficiency becomes a stronger argument. But in fact, within the United States, which, is prior, which has and is prioritizing military spending since Vietnam, you can see that the culture here has not been successful in increasing education or creativity. A lot of our work that is creative actually comes from the United Kingdom, a failed empire. A lot of the TV shows and so on are actually written by the British. And what we're really seeing is that the military style culture prioritizes certain things. Athletics is obviously one of them. Um, you know, just obviously Coliseum style events and spectacles and physical prowess. 
And you can see how something in human nature that attracts people that follow orders or that don't mind following orders typically creates a society that is not as rich in experience and actual options as competitors. And, you know, you don't have to listen to me to figure that out. You can just watch the movie Rocky IV. It's not as good as Rocky III, but that movie encompasses everything I just talked about. And what's interesting about China is because China has a rich history of not just education, but invention, philosophy, and so on and so forth, the idea is that capitalism with Chinese characteristics may be or may become the most successful system, both culturally and economically. And that is what that's the direction that most people think that we're heading towards. The issue with the Soviet Union before was the failure to leverage military technology and military investment in technology into the banking sector. Because the Soviet Union was attempting to prioritize different things like farming and agriculture and, infra and physical infrastructure. And if you look at what the Chinese have done, they've managed to harness technology in a way that not only allows them to learn from Singapore's financial success, but also Hong Kong's financial success. And so China really has, as of today, massive advantages because of its ability to copy Hong Kong and Singapore and learn from them in a way that allows it to do all the things we just talked about, to move towards a system of inclusive incremental progress. And as China is doing these things, the United States doesn't seem to have the same ability to show progress in part because costs have gone up substantially making it difficult to do all the things I just talked about, which is to be mobile, which is to increase wages if you're a small business that will attract the kind of employees that you want to attract and so on and so forth. And so you have a system where the Chinese per capita have an advantage over the Americans today, even though per capita income in China is far less than per capita income in the United States. And somehow, because of the model that the Chinese are using, somehow that weakness has become a strength. And you sort of wonder how that's possible. And it's difficult to put your finger on that issue, on the causes of that issue, because ordinarily you would think that a country that has a million dollar house or, or thousands or hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people owning expensive homes and the land on which those homes are on, you would think that kind of a society would have advantages clearly over another kind of society that had fewer people owning extremely expensive homes. But what's really happened is a lot of the value in these homes has resulted because of debt, not wage, in, not wage increases, at least not sustainable ones. And so what's really happened is that post-World War II, the Western system succeeded because it had a better banking system. And as a result, it leveraged, both literally and figuratively, its banking system in order to create more and more prosperity for more and more people but it's done so in a way that's unsustainable. Because once you have a neighborhood that's filled with homes that cost $800,000 or more, that is indistinguishable, or not different at all, than another neighborhood 2,000 miles away, or 1,000 miles away, or even 100 miles away, 
in terms of educational quality, in terms of housing size, in terms of convenience and public transportation, what you've really done is simply create a system where the million dollar home doesn't, does not reflect incremental progress in a way that others can copy. It just reflects an alliance between a banking system and a local or state government. And you can also see how that kind of a system makes it easier to have one political party in power. And that's precisely what's happened in the United States, in California, which is one of the most indebted states in the country. In this state, every single political office is controlled by one party. The state by itself is one of the largest economies, just a state in the entire world. And it's controlled by a single party across the board. Governor, legislature, you have cities that are different, but I'm talking about the state. And you can see how that kind of a system, if it's based on debt, isn't transferable to a small town in Mississippi. You can't take the ideas here and take them and go to Mississippi and create a carbon copy. But if the Chinese government figures out how to build housing in a way that reduces energy costs, that makes it easier and more comfortable for residents to get around and to communicate with each other and to get the things they need. If the government in China creates a system of a more livable community, but does so through a condo type build out, as opposed to a single family home type build out, who should say that second system is wrong or worse? And who's to say the Chinese model, which allows it to incrementally improve its citizens' lives across the entire country over time because the government is involved in setting or building home, or I shouldn't say homes, in building housing structures, in figuring out how to minimize the environmental impact or water use from those housing structures. You can also see how that kind of a system would allow Chinese investments to be leveraged overseas. In other words, if the Chinese build a train that works, that is efficient, you can see how they'd be able to sell that. In other words, they're leveraging knowledge as opposed to debt, although certainly they're, they're also leveraging debt. But if they're using the debt in a way that allows them to create a, an enviable model that can be exported, you can see how that kind of a system would be profitable. Now, let me, let me show you something. I'm, the homes here are nothing special, right? They're nice, but you know, it's a million, that's a million dollar home. Nothing special, it's just an ordinary size home. But right outside of it, I guess you can't see it. Uh, the sidewalks are uneven. They're not paved properly, probably because of the earthquakes that we have here. There aren't potholes here, but I've seen them nearby. And so you can see how private property ownership of the, of the land isn't always, doesn't always result in a favorable outcome because if you have a massive condo in China and there's a problem, you're going to have thousands of people complaining to the, to the local government, which will then lose credibility if it doesn't fix that problem. Whereas here, if the city doesn't fix uneven pavements, if it doesn't fix potholes, well, I mean, people, life goes on. There's really not much of an incentive because to fix the pothole or to fix these uneven pavements, 
you probably have to tear up, do almost more damage than it's worth. And it's expensive. And because of all the lawyers, you probably have to have different contracts. You have to probably maybe even negotiate them, hire from a particular pool of employees, and so on and so forth. So as you're studying or thinking about political issues, the most important issue to think about if you're interested in political philosophy is how the heck do we end up in almost the same situation in the year 2021 when we've been told all of our lives that capitalism and communism are completely different and not only completely different but inimical to each other and hostile to each other.